Alright, and welcome to part two of this AAR of March of the Eagles. War is going, essentially, the war capacity. Um, you know, what percentage you are of your total potential war capacity. As well as things like war exhaustion. Which is the same as Crusader Kings 2. Hopefully I can get here to the north. If I can get to the north, I can uh, take at least a good chunk of Norway. Trodenheim was attempted to be seized by the Swedish during the Great Northern War at the start of the 18th century, but they failed several times. Let's see, Prussia made peace with Denmark. The seed Kiel, Schleswig. And they will annul all treaties with France and Spain. Okay, so that's not that bad. I mean, Prussia made peace with Denmark. Um, not really worrisome to me. Uh, Prussia got some of the historical areas that they would end up taking from Denmark uh, later in the uh, 19th century. And uh, there, good. Nothing that I'm not happy with, I guess, is my point. Kind of surprised it didn't take Hamburg, though. So there's the war score screen. As I said, war exhaustion manpower, uh, war capacity, different measurements of, you know, how you're doing in the conflict, essentially. Alright, we got to Trodenheim before the British. Looks like they've got a small little fort there with a garrison of a thousand men. We'll go ahead and launch an assault. That should be a pretty quick victory. 30 to 1 odds. I like my odds there. Another victory. You get kind of a summary there on the bottom of the, the battle window as well that kind of tells you different things that occur during a fight or during a battle. So different events, you know, when you use things like your, your character's traits and whatnot. Alright, our relations with pressure are getting worse, I believe. Not what I want, but at least they're getting better with Russia. You do use prestige to improve relations. I'm not quite sure why your prestige gets used up by trying to improve relations. I guess as a war game, maybe that makes some sense, but I don't really understand it. So I've got that tiny little sliver. Thankfully I got that fort, which is one of the very important parts of Norway, but all I got was a tiny little sliver on the southern southern portion of the field. Hopefully I get more of the northern. Kind of in a race with the Brits. Yeah, there's the British. I got the Verdal first though, but they're gonna they're gonna beat me to Arns, so I'll lose that low province to him. One thing about wars and, and fighting in this game is sometimes it definitely seems things uh, devolve to just a race fest, where you just kind of race around the map chasing units and. That can be a little annoying at times. My frigate's done at least. Let's go ahead and join the main fleet with it. Russia still doesn't have any men on their border, so that's not noth nothing to be worried about there. Looks like that town's uh, got a fort and the British don't have enough men to attack it. Can use those 10,000 men down there. Maybe I can seize that province from the British. They took Arns, but I should have the edge on getting to the northernmost parts of, uh, of Norway. 
I think one thing about these games, I was kind of talking about it earlier, and then I, my train of thought got interrupted with something that else came up, something else that came up. Uh, I enjoy playing these types of games as uh, as a country of like Sweden or maybe Denmark, um, because you know when we think Napoleonic War, we think France. Oh, it looks like that that province went to the British anyway. Um, we when we think of the Napoleonic Wars, we think of France. That's really what we think of first and foremost. Um, we don't think, we're going to go ahead and merge these units, we don't think of the other countries as anything except fighting France. And I think it's important to recognize that really until 1813 or so, 1814, um, there were lots of wars against the, the French, and there were lots of coalitions, you know, Austria, Russia, Britain, they all fought France at different times. Often alone though. The Austrians and the, Fr the Russians fought France in you know 1805. The Prussians fought France in 1806. Um, the Austrians again in 1808 and 1809. Uh, the Russians in 1812. Britain was really the only one who was at war the whole time. It wasn't until 1813, 1814 that all of these nations came together and fought France at once. There were times they were overlapping that they were fighting, but really, you know, these nations still were looking after their own interests here. You know, for the the majority of the Napoleonic Wars, they were still pursuing other endeavors. They didn't drop uh, their goals, um, you know, just because of Napoleon. Um, you know, this, the Swedish, as I mentioned, they fought a war against the Russians, I believe, and, and I should be looking this up, but I'm just kind of speaking while playing, so I apologize here if some of this isn't correct. I believe it was 1807 when the Swedish fought uh, both, I believe it was the Danish and the Russians, uh, definitely the Russians, um, and they lost um, Finland uh, to the Russians. Um, and then they fought the, the Danes in... 1814. Now that was part of the Napoleonic campaigns. Denmark was, you know, on the French side, and they took Norway. But the Russians fought the Ottomans, you know, numerous times. The Russians also fought some uprisings in Poland, I believe. Uh, the Russians obviously fought the Swedes. Um, you know, there were a lot of countries that were still pursuing their own objectives, if you will, uh, during the Napoleonic Wars. Europe didn't simply stop and stare in awe at Napoleon. Napoleon was the preeminent force during the Napoleonic Wars, there is no doubt. Um, but it wasn't a world war type situation where the entirety of Europe was aligned against him or anything like that. At least not until, you know, later in the conflicts. That's not to take anything away from what Napoleon accomplished. He was obviously a fantastic commander. France fighting Austria and Russia at the same time, or subduing Prussia, or essentially just essentially racing around Europe, crushing everyone piecemeal, was, was pretty impressive in of itself. Um, but it wasn't really a total war. I mean, the, the conflict escalated substantially as the wars went on. Um, in 1805, Austerlitz had, what, like 70, 80,000 Russians and um, roughly as many French um, fighting, you know, in that conflict. Um, by 1814, the Battle of Leipzig, there were over 200,000 um, allies and French, you know, over half a million soldiers uh, fighting at the Battle of Leipzig. You know, you had 30,000 Swedes, you had... Um, I don't know the other numbers. I just know the Swedish because I was doing a little bit of uh, reading on the Swedish, you know, kind of in, in preparation for, for playing this. But, you know, you had over half a million men fighting at the Battle of Leipzig versus, you know, combined maybe 150,000 before. Um, and that was kind of similar with most of the earlier battles as they were much smaller in scale. And then as the war went on, uh, the armies involved got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um... You know, the, the early battles in the Napoleonic Wars um, really weren't all that much larger than, you know, some previous wars. Uh, if you compared the later battles, though, it was a totally different, um, totally different animal, 
um, if you will. I find it interesting that the Prussians didn't take Hamburg. I, I don't know if they didn't have a high enough war score, but they, they have Hamburg surrounded now, but the Danes still have it. Okay, Napoleon is king of Italy. Great. Italy isn't even a country. They've got a little valley that they call Italy. So that... Probably taking so long to get back from that northern reaches of uh, Norway, given the, the climate. Alright, we're going to go ahead and land on this island. I'm doing everything I can to try and, you know, increase Denmark's... Uh, or increase my war score against Denmark. I really just want Norway. No, I don't really know how peace works when another country occupies a lot of that territory, I hope. Great, the Danes landed some troops there. As I said, there I believe there was a landing land bridge between Co or Copenhagen and and uh, Sweden, and it appears there is because their fleets blockaded. They didn't land eighteen hundred men. No real threat. I mean, it's it's a very small force, but annoying. But um. You know, I'm, I don't know how it works when, you know, obviously I occupy a chunk of Norway, Britain occupies a chunk of Norway, I'm not quite sure how that works if I make peace. Uh, the Danes, that little icon you see popping up on the screen when that noise was made, the Danes offered me peace, but probably not what I want. Now one other thing you also see here, uh, transports have a limit on how many units they can transport so one transport can carry for example five brigades it doesn't really have a weight you know cavalry doesn't have a heavier weight than infantry it's just a general kind of pretty simple interface for moving troops around by sea is trans one transport carries five brigades that's all you really need to know so I'm gonna bring them back to mainland Sweden here now that I took the island doesn't look like the Danes have enough I'm not quite sure how it determines, you know, when you're going to keep a province or when, you know, if you move to the next province, you lose the previous one. As you see, each one they march to is the previous one then comes back to my control. So I'm not quite sure how that's determined. But, you know, if you move with 100,000 men, let's check the peace offer. So they're just willing to admit that they lost. That's not really what I'm looking for. I want that territory. So I'm going to go ahead and decline that. Um, but... Uh, if you move an army of like 200,000 men through a territory and then you move on to the next territory, you'll keep the original one occupied. If it's a smaller force, you won't. You'll also see there if there is a fort, you have to overcome the fort before the territory becomes occupied. As we saw earlier when I was attacking. Now obviously there's a fort there, so um, that remains mine. We look at the war score here. Denmark only has 20%, 26% war capacity. So basically that means almost all their armies have been completely crushed. It's taking those guys forever to get back from the north. I'm guessing uh, climate has an impact on that. Let's see what they are willing to concede to and defeat. Um, Trodenheim, they will accept that. But not if I bundle it with the other territory. So as you see there, the green uh, lines with stripe are what I would take if we signed a peace deal. Um, so it's more than what I currently occupy. It lo looks like I would get a good chunk of what Britain currently occupies. That's nice. question is, do I want to settle for just one, or do I want to keep fighting and take both? I'm not quite sure which would be more valuable. Trodenheim would give me more territories, but wouldn't really... Give me the, the fortress in the south that I really want. Hmm. It would give me the bulk of Denmark. Or, not Denmark. I keep saying Denmark. The bulk of Norway. Apparently I'd get the, all that land that the British have. Huh. Wish I could offer to pay them, but I don't think they'd sell their land. So, we're going to keep fighting. I need to increase my war score so I can um, get more land. I don't really want to occupy all of Denmark. You know, I could probably land my main army in Denmark and and uh, take all of it. All I really want is Norway. And you can't request a province without... without owning it. Now, as you saw during the peace deal, you know, there are capitals to different regions of the city. So Trondheim, for example, uh, is the capital, more or less, of the northern half of Norway. Frekerstad is of that... Uh, kind of 
border buffer area, if you will, um, Christani or Christania, uh, or Christinia, I'm not quite sure what it was called, uh, essentially Oslo, what will be called, called Oslo, is another center. Uh, all those locations that are centers of, of an area of a um, state or province or whatnot um, also have fortresses or, or garrisons um, that you have to assault or siege out. All right. One thing that is a little bit annoying about this game is it kind of turns into a chase fest where you seems like you're chasing troops all around, and they are still up there in the north. It um, seems like you end up chasing small little armies around. That's one thing that this series of games needs to improve upon. You know, you, you crush an army of 40,000 men, they have no avenue of retreat, and yet they retreat into a friendly territory rather than surrendering. I mean, it, it, a lot of times it just takes forever to overcome small little armies and chase them around the map and waste lots of time. And I, I think that's probably my biggest criticism against the, I don't know if it's the Klausowitz engine or just the way that they have the engine programmed, um, but that's one of my biggest complaints against Crusader Kings 2, and that also applies here uh, to um, March of the Eagles. Now we're going to fast forward a bit here, I've, uh, just because, um, you know, it's uh, going to... I'm going to stop recording for a little bit and just kind of fast forward a bit. Because right now all I am is chasing around these small little units which have no help of beating me. And I have no way to increase my war score against the Danes. So I'm going to go ahead and stop recording for a bit. I will pick the recording up in a little bit. We get a little bit further along where maybe I've got some kind of sense that there's going to be a resolution to something. Because as I said right now I'm just chasing them around. Um... And uh, I think that's probably pretty boring for you to watch. So I'm going to go ahead and stop recording for a few moments. And uh, we'll uh, just kind of fast forward, if you will. I am recording this while playing. But uh, we're going to go ahead and fast forward till there's something more worthy to look at, if you will. Um, so just one moment. All right. Uh, we fast forwarded a bit here. Still kind of chasing these units around the... Uh, the Danes have uh, some small little armies racing around Finland, causing a nothing more than annoyance. Um, meanwhile, they did, did sort of did the same thing against the British in Norway, so I was able to take a couple more small little provinces um, in the uh, areas of Norway. Hopefully, it didn't really influence my war score at all, but um, I'm moving my main army here to try and siege... Uh, Copenhagen. If I can take their capital, I should be able to force a more satisfactory peace against them. Um, gosh. And that's where I was talking about just before, you know, we kind of fast forwarded. It's just chasing these tiny little armies around. It's just, it doesn't seem plausible to me to have, you know, an army of a thousand men deep in the heart of Sweden with no supply route, losing a battle, and then being, you know, running all over the place. I mean, it just, uh, it's just annoying. But uh, their fleet's still blockaded. Copenhagen's now under siege. And I'm chasing. Chasing, chasing, chasing. Now, I didn't look at all the features in here. You know, we kind of looked at the ideas, the, the fact that you can kind of... Uh, okay, just another event that comes up. You get little events that come up every now and again. I didn't really look at all the details in the game. You kind of saw the budget screen. You saw the military screen where you can recruit troops, um, being able to look at different leaders and whatnot. Um, kind of a little bit of diplomacy, although not a whole lot. We're going to go ahead and decline their peace offer again. Um, you know, we didn't look at all the buttons, all the controls here in this AAR, if you will. Um, mainly we're just focusing on kind of the military aspects of trying to take Norway, which is... Uh, it didn't quite go as I planned, although I, it'd be interesting. I mean, I did see the Danes had about a 50,000-man army at one point, so uh, either Prussia, or I'm guessing Prussia, or Britain had to crush that at one point because I never faced anything that large. Um, so I basically just kind of picked up on some free spoils. Um, but as I said, we basically mainly looked at uh, sort of this military aspect of things. The full-fledged review, it's going to be a written review. It's going to be on the site uh, within, I believe, within a week. Um, so that's going to have more more detail of the different features and gameplay. You know, you don't want to ruin everything um, or, or show everything in one of these. So, you know, the game is deeper than what I'm showing here. 
but I am showing just kind of the typical experience that you're going to see when you're fighting a war when you're playing the game. Um, this is really kind of the typical look of the game, look and feel of the game. Um, and, you know, right now is probably the most frustrating point. You know, the game is a lot of fun, there's no doubt. Um, I really enjoy it. Um, but if there's one thing that frustrates me, it's that chasing element. Uh, a whole bunch of events down there. They seem to pile up real quick. Um, but that nice little button that I always seem to click here along the side pulls up all the options so you can kind of read through them and, and get rid of all these little notices real quick here. They'll have different, uh, you know, little sayings, if you will, um, if it's more important. If it's just kind of a notice, it's just okay. If it's a piece or something like that, it'll throw a worrisome or perhaps we can benefit by it. Um, so it'll kind of give you a little clue as far as whether it's important or not. At this point, I just want to force Denmark to accept my peace, though, and then, then we can, then we can kind of go from there. Thirty-three thousand men there besieging the Danish army in their capital. I lost a battle over there. Good thing the Danes don't have enough men to retake that fort. That would be annoying. Looks like Copenhagen, the siege of it anyway, is pretty safe. I'm not going to launch an assault because they've got over 2,000 men in artillery and 7,000 garrison troops. I would definitely be slaughtered um, launching an assault against a fortress. So now it's just kind of waiting. I mean, the port's blockaded, so their supply should be dwindling. It's just a waiting game until the siege goes through until they surrender. Um, so it can take a little while, but like I said, I'm not going to launch an assault against them. I, I wish there was a way you could kind of tell how long a unit's going to hold out in a siege. Um, I guess that's a good thing. It's probably pretty realistic not to know how much, how much food or supplies the enemy has. At the same time, I don't believe you can really see when you're besieged how long you have until... Uh, until you're going to run out of food or, or whatnot. So that that's kind of a two-edged sword there. Looking through the different battles that have been fought in the war. See if Denmark's willing to uh, agree to that peace I want. I just want Trotterham and Frank Frankenstadt now. I recognize I'm not going to get all of Norway, but I'm going to get most of it. Um... Oslo or Kristiania or whatever it's called uh, probably is the most profitable part that I'm going to be missing out here but with the the Danes being at war with the British there's no way for me to to take these provinces from the British unless I declare war on them and I really don't want to do that the British armies in this game do seem to be bigger than historic than you know in history um, just the game mechanics, you know, with as wealthy as Britain needs to be for their massive navy, they do tend to uh, have a, a much larger army than would be historical, but it's not game-breaking. They're still primarily a sea power. But I still won't agree to my peace. Chasing around. Raise some troops to lift the siege there. But anyway, let's go ahead and I'm going to stop the recording for a moment. Uh, it's probably not that much. Uh, going on for a little bit here. So I'm going to stop the recording for a little bit until uh, we have some more significant uh, items to, to discuss. Um, well, actually, let's go ahead and try and take that.
will be two evenly matched armies, two men of about 4,200 men. Hopefully the garrison will come out. That can happen when you launch an attack as you get a benefit of some of the garrison troops that will kind of turn the tide. So we'll see. They're fighting down there as I'm trying to chase these guys up here. Goodness, they keep taking small little territories and they're holding it too. Uh, looks like I was victorious down there. So I did beat them, although only just they uh, took about the same amount of casualties. One thing you will see in this game, it seems to be pretty accurate too, is that um, when you fight a, a battle, you know, if you fight your main army against the main army of another side, uh, generally the winning side is going to win the war. You know, it's not easy to raise huge amounts of troops. It takes a while to, um, you know, get get reinforcements built up. So if you have an 80,000 man army and it's just crushed, you know, Britain's different because they're an island. They can, oh, we took the city. Um, they can, uh, so let's go ahead and see if they'll make peace. The British can kind of sit off on their island. They don't really make peace. But, uh, you know, if you're, you're Austria or you're Prussia and your, your main army's crushed, I mean, you've got enough men there to kind of um, continue fighting if you really want. But in the Napoleonic Wars, you know, at least in the earlier wars, one crushing defeat would often lead to a peace. Um, speaking of which, let's see here. They will accept our peace offer. All right. Let's see if I can get some money from them, too. Uh, they'll give me 50. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and submit that and then uh, see what happens here. But as I, was, as I was saying, you know, one or two crushing defeats often would be all that it would take to knock a, a country out of the war. They accepted my peace. All right, and I got all that land from the British, too. So I took the majority of Sweden here. Um, with that, that's going to kind of wrap up this, uh, this video. I didn't mean to interrupt my thoughts there, but essentially I was just saying that, you know, in this game, you know, a crushing defeat often was all it took. Uh, to end your country and force you to accept peace and that's kind of the way it was in real life too and, and that that's modeled well in this game um you know it was different later in the war but at least early in the war that's the way things were anyway as you see there i expanded sweden significantly i didn't take all of norway but that's because the british are busy occupying that um, that's all it's going to be for this video though here um, so for the wargamer.com, thanks for watching. Stay tuned for a written review, which will be coming up shortly. And have a great day. And uh, yeah, please subscribe to the Wargamer's uh, YouTube channel here. Um, we have a whole lot of different uh, videos and events. So um, yeah, throw a like in and uh, subscribe and have a great day.